One of these images is not like the other. Can you spot which one? All right, so this is pretty easy, but how about in time series data? Which of these data streams is the odd one out? Okay, fine, that's also pretty simple. But what about these images? Or these time series? Can you tell which is the expected behavior and which is anomalous behavior? It can get pretty tough to identify events or patterns that differ from the expected behavior through inspection alone. And as I'm gonna show you later in this video with a demonstration, it's especially difficult to find very subtle changes in the behavior of hardware. And this is where anomaly detection can be beneficial. Anomalies are deviations from the expected behavior, and anomaly detection algorithms are trying to find those deviations. Now, deviations don't necessarily mean that a fault has occurred, or that something is broken or not performing to within its spec. It's simply a difference. And understanding when those differences occur in your data can be really helpful. So let's talk about that. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. Anomaly detection is useful for many applications, including looking for fraud in financial transactions, checking for defects in manufacturing production lines, and looking for unusual movements in video surveillance footage. However, what I want to expand on more in this video is how anomaly detection can be used for finding the sort of low-hanging fruit in predictive maintenance applications. With predictive maintenance, an algorithm is looking for specific fault trends in a machine and is trying to come up with an estimate of how much time is left before failure. And this estimate will help you determine when to schedule maintenance and which parts of your system require it. But the downside of predictive maintenance is that it typically requires a lot of historical data in order to train the algorithm to predict those faults. That is, we need to know what failure looks like from similar machines that have failed in the past. Now, obviously we don't want machines to fail, and so we go to great lengths to prevent those failures. But that means that some faults happen so infrequently that you might not have enough data to successfully learn to classify them. Now, on the other hand, anomaly detection isn't looking for faults. It's looking for deviations from the nominal system. And to detect when a system is behaving differently than expected for any reason, you just need data for the normal behavior. And that is usually pretty easy to come by since hopefully your system runs normally most of the time. And this makes anomaly detection easier to set up than a full up predictive maintenance algorithm. And if ultimately you do want to set up predictive maintenance, then running anomaly detection is still beneficial because it's a good way to flag possible failure data that you can then use for predictive maintenance training. All right, so if I've convinced you that anomaly detection is worthwhile, let's now talk about how it works. And I'm gonna keep this rather generic because there are a lot of different ways to approach anomaly detection algorithmically. For example, you could set a threshold on a particular metric and then just check to see if it's ever exceeded. And thresholding is a very simple and straightforward approach, especially for single variate data. Now, for anomalies that require looking across multiple variables, or for ones that have multiple types of features that indicate the anomaly, then something a little more robust might be needed. For example, you can use machine learning approaches like one class support vector machines, or isolation forests, or autoencoders, just to name a few. Each of these all have the same basic structure. In some way, they learn a model using data of the expected behavior, and then use that model to determine if the observed behavior falls outside of what the model considers normal. For one-class SVMs, the model is a hyperplane that maximizes the distance between expected and unexpected behavior. For isolation forests, the model is a tree that isolates each observation into a leaf. And the more decisions it takes to isolate an observation, the less likely it is to be an anomaly. And with autoencoders, the model is a deep neural network that is trained to reconstruct the input data. And the better it does at reconstruction, the more likely it is that the data is expected. And there's more than just these three algorithms, but I just want to give you a sense of how different ways to model the expected behavior can help you determine when an anomaly has occurred. 
All right, so I think at this point, it might be easier to understand anomaly detection if we can watch one of the algorithms in action using some real hardware. And for this example, I'm gonna use the Cube Servo 2 from Quanzer. This is a rotary inverted pendulum, and I'm controlling it with a feedback controller that's trying to keep the red arm upright, while also following a reference angle for the silver arm. And the reference is just a square wave that is stepping back and forth and back and forth over and over again. Now I'm using four measurements to control the system, but I'm only recording two of those measurements, the motor voltage in volts and the angle off vertical of the red pendulum in degrees. And these are the only two that I'm gonna use for anomaly detection. And right now you can see that for the most part, the motor voltage is very low and the pendulum angle is near zero degrees except for when the reference steps to a new location, and then both the voltage and the angle increase slightly to follow that reference before settling back down. This is the nominal hardware behavior, since I know that it's functioning as I designed it. Now, I don't know every type of failure for this system, and so instead of checking explicitly for very specific failures, I'm just going to check to see if any anomalies occur going forward. So my first step in anomaly detection is to define the nominal behavior in some way so that I can determine if the behavior deviates from it going forward. And for this example, I'm gonna use an autoencoder to model the nominal behavior. An autoencoder is a type of deep neural network that attempts to reduce the dimensionality of the input data. And what that means is that it takes the high dimension input data, encodes it into a lower dimension by representing it with less information, and then it decodes it again to reconstruct the original data. And if the data is dominated by low dimensional behaviors, like the predictable dynamics of the pendulum, then the autoencoder will capture those dynamics in the encoding process and essentially ignore other things like sensor noise, since that would take more dimensions to recreate those random motions perfectly. So if we train the autoencoder on this nominal behavior, we would expect the reconstructed data to match the general behavior of the pendulum, but ignore more of the high frequency noise and other motions. So let's do that. I found this MATLAB example called time series anomaly detection using deep learning, which uses an autoencoder on time series data, which is exactly what I want to do. So for the most part, I'm following along with this example and then just tweaking it slightly for my particular problem. And the main difference is that instead of three data channels, I only have the two, motor voltage and pendulum angle. And the reason why I like this example is that it's training the autoencoder directly on the raw data, which is something that I wanna try first. Anomalies are often difficult to detect in raw data, even for machine learning, since the raw data can have high dimensionality, and therefore the algorithm has to learn completely on its own how to narrow down all of that information into patterns that indicate normal behavior. But on the other hand, I could do a little feature engineering and pre-process the data in such a way that highlights the features that I think are most likely to indicate anomalies. And then the machine learning algorithm only needs to learn using just those particular features. Again, I'm gonna try the raw data approach in this example and see how it does. However, the derived feature approach is very popular for real world problems. All right, so to begin, I collected 10 minutes of nominal data from my hardware. And then just like the example, I split it up into training data and validation data. And I left the autoencoder architecture the exact same as it was in the example as well as all of the training options. And then I just train this network with the train network MATLAB function. And overall, this whole thing took about a minute or so to run. But now that I have a network that does a pretty good job of reconstructing the nominal input data, I can run that model on new incoming data with the predict function. So the predict function output is the network's attempt at reconstructing the input data. And if we go back to the real time running of the hardware, that's exactly what we see over here. The blue lines are the reconstructed data from the trained autoencoder given these raw data inputs. 
And this third figure down here just plots the raw data and the reconstructed data on the same chart so that we can see how well the network was able to capture the essential dynamics of the system. And visually, it appears to do a pretty decent job. However, we can quantify how good of a job it's doing by looking at the mean absolute error between these two signals. So I'm taking this four seconds of raw data and reconstructed data, and I'm calculating the mean absolute error between the two, and then showing it over here. Notice that when the pendulum is stationary, the error is pretty low. It's less than 0.1. And when it performs those fast dynamic maneuvers, the error increases a bit to about 0.18 or so. And this is telling me that the autoencoder probably hasn't perfectly captured the nominal dynamics of this system. Otherwise, I would expect the mean error to be about the same in both situations. But perhaps it's good enough. We'll soon find out. This red line is at the maximum error that the autoencoder has produced in recreating the nominal data. And so with this red line as a threshold, we now have a way to check for anomalies. We can assume that as long as the system is behaving nominally, the autoencoder network will be able to reconstruct the data to within this error threshold. However, if new dynamics crop up in the system, or if there are new external influences on this system, then we would expect that the network would not be able to reconstruct the data as well. And therefore, the error would be greater than this threshold. In this way, to detect anomalies going forward, we just need to look at this error term and compare it to the threshold. So let's try it out. I have the pendulum running nominally, and as you can see, the error is below the threshold. However, let me disturb the pendulum. Now, even though the controller was able to compensate for that disturbance and the arm stayed upright, the autoencoder network was unable to reconstruct those strange dynamics as well, and the error jumped above the threshold, indicating an anomaly. Now, poking it with my finger is a pretty obvious disturbance, but the nice thing about anomaly detection is that the anomaly itself can be very subtle to a human and still produce more error through the network than the nominal system does. For example, watch what happens when I use this twine to add just a small amount of friction to the pendulum arm. This particular anomaly is one that is quite common for motor-based systems. Bearing drag often increases over time and you wanna be able to detect that increase and flag it for further action. And as you can see, it didn't take much of a deviation to trigger a detection. The pendulum angle and the motor voltage don't appear to visually change very much, but this additional drag produced a signal that the autoencoder network couldn't reconstruct as well, and an anomaly was triggered. All right, so lastly, I want to show you that this algorithm can also detect other types of anomalies, like a change in the load on the motor. And I'm going to create this error by adding a small amount of well, change onto the tip of the pendulum. And notice how when I first drop them into the little cup, there's a slight force from them that trips the detector. So far, so good. But we should also be able to catch the change in dynamics when the pendulum swings to the other side. <laughs> All right, yeah, it uh, caught it. Um, that might've been too much change for this controller to handle. All right, so I'm not gonna add any new anomalies into this system, but hopefully this demonstration shows you how anomaly detection works to find any deviations from the nominal system rather than looking for a specific deviation. And what's really cool about this is that this algorithm could be run real time like I'm doing here or run periodically on save data to check for historical anomalies. Also, anomaly detection could be tied into a larger design where something is counting the number of times an anomaly occurs in, say, a week. And an operator is just looking at how fast that counter is growing to determine when to intervene. It's all really cool, and the number of uses is sort of unlimited. So I hope you go and try it out yourself. All of the references and resources that I used in this video are linked below. All right, that's where I'm gonna leave this video. If you don't wanna miss any other future Tech Talk videos, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And if you wanna check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well.
Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.